land of rugged splendor in the wild, wild west. With sky-high cliffs and cavernous canyons. One of a few places on Earth where nature has made so much magic and mystery. We'll climb up to a spot once reserved for the angels, plunge down deep into the hidden underworld of watery canyons, and take a hike through the narrowest of slots. Along the way, we'll meet the diverse creatures of the desert, saddle up for a ride into scenic wonders, and beat a path to backcountry adventure to let you in on the many secrets of Zion and Bryce Canyon National Parks. In the high desert of the Southwest, with elevations ranging from 4,000 to 9,000 feet, the state of Utah is a showcase of one stone spectacle after another. Yet, among nature's grandeur, two places are monumental. One of the best ways to uncover the secrets of Zion and Bryce is to fly over the Grand Staircase. The famous geologic region that connects the two parks located within a two-hour drive of each other. All the major periods of geologic time are exposed right in this immediate area so people can study and look at how the Earth has changed over about half its history. And the story starts at the Grand Canyon and goes all the way up through Zion and Bryce and just all the different colored rock layers form the different cliffs of the Grand Staircase. The cathedral-like cliffs of Zion are striped in shades of red at the base. Over time, water has carried away all mineral deposits to create their white caps. Leaving Zion, they recede into a series of rarely seen gray cliffs that lead to the top tier of the Grand Staircase, where the fairyland of pink pinnacles of Bryce Canyon comes into view. While they share a common history, in this remote part of the world, nature's handiwork is spectacularly different. To experience the wonders of Zion, cast your eyes upward. At 229 square miles, Zion is Utah's first national park. To get another kind of overview, set your sights high on a place called Angel's Landing. You don't need a pair of wings to get there. All that's required are some strong legs and a hankering for a strenuous hike. This breath-stealing two and a half mile ascent is not for the meek or for anyone suffering from even mild vertigo. Hikers begin by taking on a zigzagging trail. This taxing vertical rise, affectionately known as Walter's Wiggles, was meticulously carved into the side of the mountain in the 1920s. In this engineering feat, 21 steep switchbacks lead to a sandy stopping point called Scout Lookout, where you can take a moment to catch your breath, along with the breathtaking view, and decide if you have what it takes to get to the top. The toughest going is the last half mile, so, Try not to look out below. The unprotected drop-off on either side leads to a point where the trail <laughs> narrows to allow only one person at a time to grasp a chain-link handrail for dear life. It's difficult getting up there. There's some scrambling at the end. You're holding onto chains. You're, you're, you've really got to be careful with your footing. But the gift at the end is miraculous. It is one of the most beautiful views I've ever seen. The name Angel's Landing came from one of the early explorers who thought only an angel would be able to land on top of it. And on a clear day, this 360 degree panorama is a touch of heaven. If the heart of Zion is the soaring mesa tops, the soul of Zion is the Virgin River. A tributary of the mighty Colorado, 
where one water-carved wonder called the Narrows is a primary backcountry attraction. Outside the park, outfitters like the Zion Adventure Company rent thermal socks and special footgear. And you'll need them. These boots are manufactured by a climbing shoe company. And this is a super sticky rubber that mountain climbers use when they go up the rocks. So essentially, you're kind of like Spider-Man. They also provide vital information about the options for exploring the area. Now, as you're hiking through the lower narrows here, there'll be a lot of twists and turns and bends. Essentially, what you'll be doing is you'll walk the shoreline, cross the river, walk the shoreline, cross the river, and you'll zigzag your way up the canyon. One final stop before heading out is the most important. This is flash flood country. So the park constantly monitors the weather. The time to be figuring out whether or not it's going to flash flood isn't when you're in the middle of the canyon. It's before you go. It's when you make the decision whether you're going to go or not go. The Park Visitor Center posts the flash flood potential ratings. Rangers advise weather forecasting is never 100%. A storm is an obvious indicator of danger. But changes in color or depth or even the debris floating in the streams may signal it's time to head for high ground. Once you're prepared, you're in for an extraordinary time. A day hike in the Narrows begins with a walk in water, meandering upstream along the North Fork of the Virgin River. The same boulders you see on the shoreline form the bed of the river channel, where they're made slippery by algae and mud. To keep your balance, a sturdy walking stick is a must. Traveling this terrain takes some getting used to. Hiking over hidden rock means planting one foot firmly before shifting your weight. It's slow going, but well worth the effort as every bend in the river brings a new revelation. A canyon wall shimmers in the golden light. Falls cascade from a mysterious source high above. The watery sides of the canyon are perfect for an array of plants called hanging gardens that literally grow right out of the rock. The vibrant wildflowers water-fed ferns and mosses make for a fertile oasis. These wet walls are also home to a healthy population of one of Zion's own. Not only does it live here, but it only lives here. It's the only place in the world that it's found. And it's this little guy right here, known as the Zion snail. And it's unique to Zion and unique to this wall in Zion. Around another bend, a moisture-loving pointy-leaf yucca plant and a high-altitude Douglas fir thrive 20 feet away from each other and make an unlikely pair. Getting through the narrows means wading through waters ankle to knee to waist high and beyond, and hiking dry riverbanks that are few and far between. Where many go a short ways before turning back, those that continue are in for the payoff. 1.8 miles upstream, the sculpted canyon walls taper to a point where the cliffs rise up 2,000 feet from a base of 20 feet, forming what has become a classic image of Zion. From this narrowest passageway, day hikers can continue as far as Big Springs. Hikers with a permit can make a grueling 16-mile two-day trek from the top of the Narrows to the bottom. But most set out for a day hike in the lower canyon. No matter how you choose to hike it, the Narrows is a place of inspiration. Well, I, I think really, if in fact that Zion can be considered the city of God, then I would look at the Zion Narrows as his private chambers. Along the trail that leads in and out of the Narrows, a desert swamp is a rare and unexpected sight. How it came to be 
is an enigma. One of the biggest questions is where did the seeds for the swamp vegetation come from? People can only speculate birds brought them in, or perhaps the river. It remains one of Zion's more beautiful mysteries. Visitors to Utah's Zion National Park often describe this geologic showpiece as heaven on Earth. With towering monoliths like the Watchmen standing guard at 2,600 feet. Amid the domes and meadows where mule deer graze, Zion will make a believer out of you. The Southern Paiute people, who lived in the region for centuries, called it Makuntaweep, meaning Straight Canyon. By the 1860s, the Mormon pioneers sought out these remote lands to escape religious persecution back east. Settling along the river, they called it Zion. The use of, of the word Zion as a name for this area relates to the scriptures in, in the Bible, especially in Isaiah referring to, to Zion as a place of sanctuary, as a place where people would gather, as a place of beauty and a place in the mountains. In 1919, what was once a religious refuge turned into a natural refuge when Zion National Park was established. The Zion Human History Museum chronicles the story of the land. From the geology to the Native Americans, the Mormon pioneers, and finally, the National Park Service. In the 20th century, the Union Pacific Railroad played a pivotal role in the story when it extended its line to nearby Cedar City in 1923. Many of the first visitors chose to leave the comfort of their rail cars to journey from the depot to Zion to camp out. They had overnight accommodations called the Wiley Camp, and these were actually tents. There was a, a desire to have overnight accommodations that were a little bit more plush. And this was part of a growing union between the National Park Service and the state of Utah and the Union Pacific Railroad. Set among cottonwood trees at the base of a beautiful canyon, the Zion Lodge opened its doors in 1925. When a fire in the 60s tragically burned it to the ground, the lodge was immediately reconstructed. But it wasn't until the 90s that the exterior was actually restored to incorporate the original color scheme, materials, and signature stone pillars. The Zion Lodge now blends into the valley as it was intended to and it continues to be a place to wine and dine, or to simply relax on the lawn and soak in the scenery. Today, the Pullman cars that once transported passengers in comfort and style are back, and you can now travel to Zion first class, aboard America's only private luxury train and it's romance on the rails. The American Orient Express celebrates the legendary era of streamlined train travel. The cars have all been restored to their former glory. These cars were all handcrafted and made back in the 1940s and 1950s. They are the vintage Pullmans that were very famous back in the golden age of railways. As you travel through the train, you'll find an incredible array of very, very fine craftsmanship, all made in very rich, original, beautiful mahogany. This posh train boasts a crew of formally attired attendants to cater to your every need. We serve eclectic American food. Our cuisine is basically creative comfort. We give people the understanding that wherever they are, in whatever region we're at, that we serve a consummate American menu. From the lap of luxury, passengers step off in Cedar City, Utah, where tour buses take them to Zion to explore the incredible country. 
The sandstone cliffs that are among the highest in the world imposed a natural barrier to automobile travel from the east side of the park until a man-made marvel, the Mount Carmel Tunnel and Highway, opened it up and connected three scenic wonders, the Grand Canyon, Zion, and Bryce Canyon National Parks in the process. Cutting a road into Zion's solid rock to carve out the mile-long Mount Carmel Tunnel was a momentous undertaking. It was a real engineering feat for its time. Uh, they actually started construction on both ends of the tunnel at the same time and they met in the middle. And I guess their measurements were pretty accurate because they were only about a foot off. A series of galleries along the side of the tunnel provided the openings to shovel out the rock loosened by dynamite blasts. It took more than 200 men over a period of three years to complete the tunnel in 1930 at a record cost of $503,000. The final link in the road was the Pine Creek Bridge, a work of masonry art that incorporates all the different colors of sandstone found in the park. One third of the two and a half million annual visitors traveled to Zion via the tunnel, where from April to October, they meet up with the Zion Canyon Shuttle. To minimize traffic at what is one of the busiest parks in the national park system, Zion brought in a free shuttle to operate along its most popular Zion Canyon Scenic Drive. But these are no ordinary buses. This is a propane-powered fleet that runs every six minutes. With large windows and skylights, this comfortable and environmentally friendly means of transportation may be the model for the future of many national parks. The overlooks and trails offer insight into Zion's geologic past. Nicknamed Color Country, the first question visitors ask is what causes the color? The answer lies in the mineral deposits of iron oxide that produce the reddish hues and the way water interacts with iron and other minerals. On the east side, you'll find one of the park's most prominent sites. A striking sculpted formation called Checkerboard Mesa stands out amid all the red rock. According to field geologist Kelly Bringhurst, this area was once like the Sahara Desert. The uh, sand was laid down in sand dunes that were anywhere from about 50 to 100 feet tall. And as the wind was blowing, the sand would get laid down on the back side of the sand dune. So we get these sweeping layers uh, within the sand that are preserved. And we call that cross bedding. It's one of the main features uh, here in Zion. The uniform vertical lines of the checkerboard pattern look like they were machine etched into the stone. They actually come from fluctuation in temperature that causes the surface to expand and contract until the stone cracks. Over time, water seeps in to widen them. In this high desert, it might surprise you that water is the primary mover and shaper, and the source of its power is the sheer force of gravity. As uplifts in the earth that began 10 million years ago continue to push the rock skyward, if I take rock and I start pushing it up, any rivers flowing down through that area are going to start slicing down through that rock. They, you know, the, the rivers, rivers are trying to reach sea level, and the higher you lift the river up, the faster the water runs and the faster it cuts down through the rocks. Along one trail, forces of nature are at work creating a three-pooled paradise stacked one above the other. At the top tier, it's clear water isn't the only architect. At Zion, things are never set in stone. In the center of this cathedral-sized rock garden, gravity has pulled down a chunk of sandstone the size of a house. Water from the first tier of the emerald pools seeps down as a trail leads to a lush middle pool that looks more like a pond filled with moisture-loving plant life. 
nestled amid slick rock, the surface of the pool becomes a perfect reflection for the surrounding cliffs. High above, a shimmering waterfall connects the upper and middle tiers with the lower pool. From a vantage point sheltered beneath a rocky overhang, the water cascades by. And this is one spot you might just want to keep to yourself. In southwestern Utah, Zion National Park's sculpted masterpieces of red rock pull your eyes skyward. Around the park on any given day, tiny specks on the sheer cliff walls are signs that a sport called rock climbing is alive and well. Lovers of the sport seek out this faraway corner of Utah to test their mettle. In traditional crack climbing, there are no bolted routes, so you're on your own to build anchors and make your way upward following the vertical crevasses in the stone walls from less than an inch to several feet wide. Needless to say, a long free climb is no place for a beginner. Jill Sheasley has been climbing here for seven years. Um, I enjoy it. I like being up high. And you're really focused and you're not thinking about anything else except looking at that rock and figuring out your next move. Climbing the wall is only half the battle. In this land of falling rock, fragments can break off the soft sandstone surface. It's an undertaking you take at your own risk. Yet with risk comes rewards. I like the exposure. I like the feeling of the movement across the rock. Um, I like being up in high places. Just look around, it's beautiful. The red rocks, the contrast with the blue sky, and it's just really a scenic place to climb. Zion was set aside to showcase the many ways erosion so magnificently shapes the scenery. The over 60 narrow canyons called slot canyons are smoothed and polished by the abrasive force of water and rocky debris. They make Zion a mecca for a relatively new sport called canyoneering. What is the difference between rock climbing and canyoneering? Well, rock climbing's main intent is to go up and canyoneering's main intent is to go down. The sport involves many disciplines of outdoor activity, from hiking to map reading, to using climbing skills, rope work, as well as some cross-terrain skills to get into these technical environments. Since Zion is a use-at-your-own-risk park, outfitters like the Zion Adventure Company take over the training. Canyoneering permits are required. Scaling down narrow canyon walls also takes technical skills and the right gear. There have been many specific developments from specialized shoes with super grippy rubber on the bottom of them that help you climb better, harnesses which help protect your gear, which are very comfortable to hang in for a long period of time. These harnesses combined with dry suits, the dry suits are designed to keep you dry, which is an amazing asset in the canyon. Ropes are probably the most important piece of equipment. They are the umbilical cord of the whole canyoneering system. These ropes are made out of a special fiber, polyester strands with a nylon core. It can hold excess of 5,000 pounds so that while you're in the canyons, not only can you be safe, that you can have equipment that lasts the whole day through. Once you're armed with ropes and a dry suit, it's time to take the stone plunge. In this slot canyon, a vertical rappel into freezing water is a real wake-up call. Whoa, that is cool. Making your way through the walled silence, you'll find out firsthand that one of the biggest challenges of getting into a canyon environment is figuring out how to get out. Cut off from the light, these fluted passageways seem more like a cave than a canyon hundreds of feet deep. Although you're on your own to get through it, canyoneering is considered a team sport. Slot canyons are isolated, so experts advise to never explore them alone. 
It's estimated canyoneering has grown a whopping 600% since 1990. And Zion's canyons make for some of the best canyoneering in the country. Park right there. With everything from deep slot canyons to high elevation forests to the desert, Zion is also host to a diversity of flora and fauna. Eileen Smith, the director of the Zion Canyon Field Institute, explains that even the smallest forms of life have a role to play. Some of the most interesting things that we have in Zion National Park are the most subtle ones. Right over here, I want to show you something that we call resurrection moss. And although now it's brown and kind of crusty looking, if it gets just a little bit of water on it, let me show you what happens to it. You have to give it a minute, but you're going to see the color change. It really greens up with the water. Like a lot of desert plants, it's a real opportunist. It doesn't get very much water at all through the year, so when it does get even a drop, all of a sudden it just springs alive. In the spring after a rainstorm here, the rocks literally turn green. Out west, the howl of the coyote is a familiar cry. It's one of the many critters who call Zion home. Although you can see a coyote any time, it's most active from dusk till dawn. This predator keeps an ear to the ground. Hunting by sound, it locates prey under the earth and does its best to keep the resident rodent population in check. The mule deer is the animal most likely to be seen browsing along the waterways. One predator you probably won't spot is out and about following the deer herds in search of a meal. The cougar, or mountain lion, normally avoids humans at all costs. At one time, there was nothing but contempt for these big cats. They were hunted down so the deer population could thrive. Now, they're a subject of study. In a mountain lion project, hair snares are collected for their DNA. A shiny pie plate is attached to a branch to pique the cat's curiosity and lure it to a tree where it brushes against the snare, leaving a few hairs behind. Biologists also put in place a motion sensing camera. It's sort of similar to the lights that you have that for security, maybe on a corner of a garage or something like that. So when you're driving, the lights turn on, except that the motion detector in this one triggers a 35 millimeter camera, similar to your typical point and shoot that you'd use if you're on holiday or just traveling around. The photos and DNA are used to monitor the mountain lion population. It's estimated the park has about 20 to 30 mountain lions within its boundaries. And this large land predator covers a lot of ground, with home ranges anywhere from five to several hundred square miles. The mountain lion is now thought to play a vital role in controlling the animal populations it preys on. And they do make an occasional appearance. You know, there's people that'll work in the park for 20 years and never see a lion, and then one will jump in front of a tour bus as it's going down the highway. So you never know. They're here and they're breeding and they're around. It's just your chances of seeing them are great, but if you get really lucky, you will. If you're lucky, you may also catch a glimpse of a herd of desert bighorn sheep standing guard high up on the cliffs. The desert bighorns are a long-awaited sight. Due to overhunting, habitat loss, and disease, they totally disappeared from the park in the 50s. They were reintroduced in 1973. To try to find them, look up. They tend to avoid forested areas where they're prey for mountain lions. The 18 species of bats found among the canyons and ledges of Zion are another subject of study. But first, you have to catch them. Researchers stretch an almost invisible net across a stream. So we'll stretch this over their drinking pond and try to catch them as they swoop in for a drink. Bats have echolocation, and bats can detect these nets. Uh, bats have good vision and bats can actually see these nets even if they're not echolocating, so it's very hard to catch them. 
the way most bat biologists say it is we only catch the dumb ones. We catch the ones that aren't paying attention, the ones that make a mistake. But once we do catch them, we'll take them out of the net, we'll be able to identify the species, whether they're male or female, uh, their general health, um, we'll measure their size, usually weigh them. Some injured bats can be rescued and rehabilitated for release back into the wild. This is a western pipistrel. This one has a dislocated right wrist. We can fix large bones, arms, for instance, or legs, and get them to heal and release a bat if it doesn't affect their flight. Uh, but there are lots of things we can't do with the very small bones. Handling bats requires a special permit, rabies shots, and gloves. When I'm handling bats in the wild, I always wear gloves. But with these guys, they're used to me, and I know how to handle bats. I've had a lot of experience, and so I don't need to wear gloves with these guys. You should never touch or pick up any wild animal that would allow you to do that. These mountain lion and bat studies are among several research efforts that help the park better understand and protect its wildlife and their habitats. The park monitors 289 species of migrating birds, as well as resident birds, like the wild turkeys who were reintroduced in the 90s. The many waterways that continue to shape Zion are also a habitat for fish. So how the fish monitoring works is that first, um, there's some electric shock that's actually put through the water, and it just stuns the fish, it doesn't kill the fish. And then afterwards, you basically put the nets in, and you grab all the fish, and you measure, and you identify as fast as you possibly can. And then we basically put them back in the water, and they're happy to go. And it actually doesn't injure the fish. And so um, it's a good way to get a count and also figure out how many young of the year there are, how many adults that are breeding in the population. And it's um, a pretty efficient way of understanding w what the population is doing. Fish are not the only ones who get to enjoy these cool waters. A hot desert afternoon is an ideal time for tubing on the Virgin River outside the park. Several companies rent tubes, and there really isn't much to it. Yet, nothing beats lying back and letting the cool current take you where it will. In this rich country of sky-high cliffs and multicolored rock, some say the entire state of Utah should be declared a national park. Stretching from the Grand Canyon to Zion and Bryce Canyon National Parks, the Colorado Plateau rises in elevation like a gigantic flight of stairs. The layers of rock that make up the geologic region known as the Grand Staircase connect the two parks and represent 250 million years of the Earth's history. With 36,000 acres, Bryce Canyon National Park is roughly one quarter the size of Zion. But what it lacks in size, it more than makes up for with its featured attraction. Thousands of delicately carved, beautiful and bizarre rock spires known as hoodoos. Well, if you were to get your hands on a regular everyday dictionary and look up the word hoodoo, you'd probably just find one definition which is the same as the word voodoo, to cast a spell or cause bad luck, another word for black magic. But if you can get your hands on a dictionary of geologic terms and you look up the word hoodoo, then you'll see that it's a pinnacle or odd-shaped rock left standing by the forces of erosion. Eons of erosion have sculpted each hoodoo. Like cloud formations, they just trigger the imagination. With names like the Mask, the Temple of Osiris, and Thor's Hammer, after the Norse god of thunder. 
One of the secrets of Bryce is when to take it all in. It's best at dawn, just as the sun peaks above the horizon. The light casts shadows that seem to breathe life into the hoodoos. Although it's called a canyon, technically, Bryce is an amphitheater of these spectacular stone shapes. Sixty million years ago, this was all ordinary limestone. But thanks to the power of erosion, these whimsical spires are unique among the badlands of the world. Unlike neighboring Zion, there are no streams here to do the sculpting. People wonder, what's carving this place when I don't see any water? It's actually water in the form of rain and snow. We get about 16 inches a year of precipitation. And uh, that water just works its magic on sculpting these spires out of this soft, weak limestone. For the adventurous, a hike into Bryce offers varying challenges. The Navajo Loop Trail begins with a steep descent from the rim. In the arid high altitude with dramatic elevation drops, it's important not to overestimate your ability. Sunscreen and plenty of water are also essential. The trail winds to the twin bridges. From there, steep switchbacks lead to an area called Wall Street. Flanked by a pair of 150-foot Douglas firs towering overhead. The trees have endured here for some 450 years. At the canyon floor, the Navajo Loop Trail connects to both the Peekaboo Loop Trail, famous for its window-like openings, and the Queen's Garden Trail. Among the Garden of Formations is the Queen's Castle. And nearby, none other than Queen Victoria herself holds court. On a barren ridge, a sparse stand of twisted trees not only look as old as the hills, they date back thousands of years. Unlike other pines that keep their needles for a couple years, these bristlecone pines may hold on to theirs for 40, allowing them to withstand periods of drought. Their longevity is also a result of resins in the trunk of the tree that prevent it from drying out. Icy winter winds may slowly kill the windward side of the trees, giving them their twisted, tormented look. But the rest lives on seemingly forever. While you can hike the trails, this is the Wild West. And there's no better way to take it all in than by sitting tall in the saddle. This is your steering wheel. You hold on to this. Let go of that rope. You can hold on right there. Okay. You keep these reins nice and loose all the time. Uh -huh. Let her follow along, all right? Okay. She's a good follower. Okay. You're going to have to help turn sometimes. After a short lesson, it's time to giddy up. Although it's called a horse trail, it's actually a mule trail. Mules, a cross between a donkey and a horse, are more sure-footed, so they make a better choice in steep terrain. As the trail sweeps by the hoodoos, it's obvious why they call this color country. The rich palette comes from the different layers of mineral compounds deposited in the rock. The southern Paiutes were among the first humans to see this site. According to their legend, the coyote god turned a disrespectful tribe to stone. And the hoodoos you see today are figures frozen in time. But the Paiutes were just passing through. Bryce Canyon gets its name from one of the first Mormon settlers, Ebenezer Bryce, 
who made a home for his family below the rim in 1875. And the locals called his scenic choice Bryce's Canyon. The name endured, even though harsh conditions made the Bryce's stay a short one. They were followed by Reuben Syrett, who came out to stake his claim on the range in 1916. The story goes a neighbor came riding up and asked him if he's seen that canyon that's over there. And Ruby said, no, uh, is it, what is it? And, and the guy, the neighbor said, well, it's a big hole in the ground, but it's really worth seeing. Ruby and his wife, Minnie, started out catering to sightseers on the canyon rim and eventually opened a place there called Tourist's Rest. By 1923, Bryce was declared a national monument, and the Union Pacific Railroad had plans to make Bryce, Zion, and the Grand Canyon part of a grand tour. They had to negotiate with Ruby in order to get the property rights here and the water rights. Ruby wasn't excited at first at selling, but they really worked at it, and there was a lot of pressure on him to sell to Union Pacific. When Ruby finally sold out, Gilbert Stanley Underwood, the same architect who designed the Zion Lodge, was brought in to design the Bryce Canyon Lodge. By 1927, the lodge and 25 deluxe cabins were open for business, drawing a record 1,800 visitors the first year. Today, it's an historic landmark and the only one of the original Underwood and Union Pacific lodges in the area left intact. Inside, everyone relaxes around a stone fireplace that acts as a focal point for an inviting lobby. One exterior feature that's unique for underwood structures is the complicated wavy pattern of the roofs that actually takes an aptitude for mathematics to figure out. That's a good thing. The 25 vintage 1920s cabins were designed to be deluxe, and even by today's standards, they measure up. Fireplaces keep things warm and cozy inside. Outside, another signature Underwood feature is the setting itself. The lodge and cabins blend into the surroundings, and the porches are the perfect places to sit a spell, or to take a moment to just enjoy being there. As for the rancher turned entrepreneur who so reluctantly sold out to the railroad, Ruby moved back down to his ranch, and at that time, a lot of the people who had stayed with him here loved him. He was a really friendly cowboy. It was a new business to him, so he wasn't very commercial about it. It was a handshake and a hug as a greeting, and treated his people like they were his family, and so they wanted to stay with him some more. Ruby not only treated his patrons like family, he knew how to show them a good time. He rebuilt Ruby's Inn right outside the entrance to the park. Ruby started out charging 10 cents for a bed and bath on the rim, and Ruby's has been providing a slice of the Old West ever since. Run by three generations of his descendants, it's one of a few places you can stay where there's truly something for everyone. Even a teepee for 24 bucks a night. There's everything from uh, Best Western Hotel with uh, luxurious hotel rooms to teepees that uh, in our campground and small camper cabins, uh, about anything you'd want. And uh, if you come in your RV, you come in your tent, there's places for you, all, all ranges of affordability. Everybody's welcome and everybody can afford to come to Bryce Canyon to visit. Just like its earliest days, the hospitality here flows all year round. Bryce Canyon National Park is surrounded by the wild and rugged country of southern Utah. Outside the park, hiking and mountain biking routes follow along the base of steep slopes and hidden canyons few people ever see. Biking the arid high desert is a challenge, but it can be an exhilarating way to take it all in. And there are many old horse trails. In Red Canyon, 
along one called the Cassidy Trail, the rocks hold some secrets about a beloved outlaw who is said to have roamed these badlands. Robert Leroy Parker, also known as Butch Cassidy, was born around these parts in 1866. And this Red Rock country Butch knew so well became a refuge. Look over here to your left. This is the hideout right here. It's just built out of rock. According to local legend, a stone pile that blends into the landscape was a hideout for the once small-time rustler who was wanted for stealing a horse when he fled Utah. And you might not know, he was more than a good crook. My mother, she knew Butch Cassidy before he ever got into trouble. He was there to a dance in uh, uh, Pangridge. Uh, they went down in a buggy and the Circle Bill guys come up on horses and Butch Cast is one of them. My mother said he was a good dancer. All the girls liked to dance with him. Butch moved on to an infamous career as a bank and train robber throughout the West. Brazenly posing for a picture in Texas in 1901 with his partner in crime, the Sundance Kid, and members of the Hole in the Wall gang. Although Butch was the mastermind behind the robberies, he was never known to have killed anyone, and he was said to be a Robin Hood of sorts. Because he took from the rich and gave to the poor. That's what he'd done all his life. If following the outlaws of the Old West doesn't capture your imagination, outside the amphitheater of Bryce, one scenic spot along the mossy cave trail is reminiscent of Zion. Water from an old irrigation ditch winds its way through red rocks and spills over a waterfall. And a small green alcove gives the trail its namesake. In the heart of the High Plains Desert, this humid space creates an underground hideaway. We end the day back at Bryce Canyon National Park where a combination of the high elevation, the lack of humidity to disrupt the light, and a location far from civilization makes it a phenomenal place to explore the heavens. Ranger Kevin Poe is Bryce's resident astronomer. In the summer months, he sets up his telescopes to give visitors a glimpse into the clear night skies. He also leads night hikes into Bryce Canyon. One of the reasons I ask everybody to leave their flashlights in their pockets is if we stay out here long enough, our eyes will adjust the darkness. And the way it works to obtain your night vision, it takes about three minutes to get one third of your ability to see in the dark. It takes about 30 minutes to get two thirds of your maximum night vision. And it takes about three hours to get total night vision. At Bryce Canyon, the full moonrise is an event. It seems so close, you could almost touch it. And with the moon providing the light, this group hits the trail for a walk in a place that protects the dark. When you get to Bryce Canyon, you can see the kinds of things at night that you can't see anywhere else under these truly dark skies. And that's a reason enough that you might come to love the darkness. One final secret of Bryce is that the Earth's most famous example of pinnacled badlands is a winter wonderland. From December to April, snows blanket the hoodoos. And if you venture out to discover this serene scene, chances are you'll have the park to yourself. Maintaining the pristine environments of Zion and Bryce Canyon National Parks is a constant challenge from minimizing visitor impact to controlling fire. In the northern part of Zion National Park, an area called Lava Point has evidence of one preventative method called a prescribed burn. Rangers set a fire under controlled conditions to try to reduce some of the underbrush and lessen the chance that a major fire may strike. What we see here is an example of some of the mechanical thinning that we did prior to the prescribed burn. We limbed up these trees up to about as high as we could reach. And the reason we did this was to make sure that the prescribed fire that we set here stayed on the ground. 
prescribed burns are all part of a changing Park Service philosophy about the role of fire in the forests. Fire works on a large scale and a large time frame. And we as humans, with our small time scale as far as the age of the Earth, um, it's hard for us to see and understand an area that we have loved for years burn and see the black trees. But many of the areas that we see throughout places in the West have been affected by fire in the past. What you see now was not what it was many years ago. Fire, like nature itself, has the power to renew and restore. It's all part of the natural forces that have shaped an inspiring land. To experience all the wonders of Zion, the saying goes, look up. To its cliffs of Navajo sandstone that fill the sky. And to experience all the wonders of Bryce Canyon, the saying goes, look down into its massive amphitheater of mysterious shapes known as hoodoos. These monumental formations are a lesson in geology that'll fill you with awe as the sweeping lands of Utah spread out before you, with places that'll take you back to the lore of the Wild West, to giddy up and go, to kick back in a rustic hideaway, or float in cool waters on a hot summer day. It's here you can hit the backcountry for a hike through giant walled streets of stone or rappel into the unknown. And nature conspires with wind and water to leave behind masterpieces of rock that are absolutely astonishing. Zion and Bryce Canyon National Parks are not only outlets for adventure. In modern times, just as in olden times, they're a place of peace, a refuge from worldly cares.